you're the basis of everything, right? When, when, the, when it hits the fan, your wife is going to look to you. When, when it hits the fan, your kids are going to look to you. Work on yourself and work on yourself professionally, work on yourself emotionally, work on yourself mentally, get outside of the box, get out of your comfort zone. Here's the thing. 50% of Americans who are W-2 employees will be laid off by the time they're 55 and not recover back to their previous level of income. This is reality. Finances are the dirt we put that pyramid on. Like we're, 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 we are handling a barrage of information 24 seven with a brain that was designed to find nuts in a forest. They will eat rice and beans and crawl through broken glass, but they're also gonna end up divorced. So the, the first thing that you gotta know is where you wanna go. I, honestly, it's on life support, in my opinion. Let's do some rapid fire questions. Starting a budget, uh, college savings, health savings accounts, crypto, HELOC. Like, oh my gosh, but poverty sucks. That, that is, I mean, I'm getting a little emotional just saying it. That is the thing that I want my daughters to, to have more than anything else. What can dads do to ease the burden of supporting their household? Dad, today we have a great treat. We have Dylan Bain. He is a financial coach. He is a father of two girls, and he has some knowledge to give us today, specifically when we're talking about finance, advice, we are going to learn a ton about his four steps to really make a dent in this universe, all the things that he thinks about health savings accounts, crypto, and a lot more. This is going to be a fun one. If you want to improve your financial situation, you are in the right place. Stick around. Let's jump into it right here now. From your perspective, sir, what is the state of fatherhood in today's society, according to you? Oh, I, honestly, it's on life support, in my opinion. I really feel like dads do not have, whether the tools, whether through community, through society, through culture, uh, to really be involved. If you look around at, at popular media, you see dads portrayed as doofuses. You see them as incompetent, as disconnected, not not part of the family. And for myself personally, I, I categorically reject that type of programming that's going out there. And it's so much of my life as, you know, since my daughters were born has been focusing on providing them with the resources, both emotionally, financially, you know, you know nutritionally um, to help them be the best versions of themselves in the world, which means that, you know, none of those archetypes that we see parroted around in society are actually worth anything in that arena. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a shame and I couldn't agree more you know, I often talk about to, you know, my fellow friends that are dads is we always have, you know, this feeling of loneliness, being a man and a father, especially in today's society, you know, our wives typically have their, their, their wives clubs, their mops, there's things that they can do, whether it's through church or something else. But we get up in the morning, we help get the kids out to school. If they're in school, we help, um, you know, get our wife what she needs. We go to work. And then we don't have time for friendship. We don't have time for these other things. And I feel like this burden on our shoulders only adds to the fact, like you said, we're on life support. Um, so yeah, that seems very um, unfortunate and sad. Um, yeah. It, well, and to add to that, like I, I'm a big fan of saying children learn in one of three ways, what you model, what you model and what you model, choose whichever one works well for you. And to understand that we're not so divorced from that, right? Do we have the examples of good fathers, of elders, of mentors, that teach us really how to not only, you know, provide for our families, but also to be able to teach our children how to love, how to be in relationship, how to be connected, how to feel safe and secure. Um, and a lot of us, we don't know how to do that for ourselves. Yeah, exactly. How can we model for our children when we're just trying to keep our head above water? Absolutely. Well, I want to dive deeper into that. Um, how would you describe what you do um, if somebody meets you for the first time? I would say that I'm a financial coach and CPA who focuses on the human behind the numbers. So, you know, kind of going into my story, you know, specifically, I was a teacher for eight years. I was a highly successful teacher, loved my students, miss them to this day, but poverty sucks. And that led to a lot of fighting with my wife that led to a lot of fighting, you know, internally, not creating the home that I wanted my daughters to grow up in. And so having to then switch and become a CPA to go into the, the you know the large corporations and you know the national uh, international accounting firms was part of that journey. And what I learned along the way was that the math didn't matter nearly as much as the person. And so you know looking at 
how do we connect with this? So for example, you know, one of the things that happened, my wife was pregnant with our second kid and I was like, Hey, you know, we're, we are going further into debt every single month. We're not making it on my teacher's salary. I'm not quite there yet that I can make the jump into the accounting world. So we're going to have a budget. And, and I, I sat down with the numbers. I'm a really good number guy. Uh, came up with all the numbers, sat down with my wife and said, all right, here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're bleeding. We got to reduce the grocery budget by 10%. My wife picked up a plate and spiked it on the floor. Like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to give us, you know, what I'm saying to her is we need to be more financially responsible. We need to, to secure our financial future. That's what I'm saying. But what she's hearing is you're going to starve me and my children. Yeah. This is not a numbers. My wife is a PhD level engineer. <laughs> she understands numbers. But money is an emotional conversation first, and all the numbers are a distant second. And so that's kind of, that was kind of when I woke up to the idea like, oh, if I really want to provide the world I want my daughters to grow up in, I want to provide them with the horse lessons and the summer camps, and I want, I want them to you know, you know, have the abundance to be able to make mistakes and learn, I need to learn this emotional language to be able to love their mother and communicate with their mother and model that behavior to them. And so my entire practice in financial coaching, and this is true in my CPA firm that I own and operate as well, is I'm always looking at the human first. What is the story? What is the emotional charge? What are the hopes, dreams, fears? What are the things that they're bringing in from their past into this conversation? Makes makes perfect sense. And, you know, you look at how your wife and you model that relationship moving forward. Now, when you were having that spike the floor moment with the dish, that was in what, 2017 or so? So we've seen quite the inflationary spiral. 2015. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, even I think that conversation today is all the more painful, right? Oh, 100%. I mean, like, stop and think about what money... You know, if you if you understand, you know, in brief, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You have to, your base level needs or your survival needs, then safety and security, then relationships, esteem, and self actualization. Finances are the dirt we put that pyramid on, right? Like everything is dependent on that. So when you look, when you're talking about money, you're talking about safety and security. You're talking about food, which of course is a biological fundamental need. You're talking about the ability to have relationships and say yes to opportunities. It's huge. And in, in an era of inflation, when eggs, you know, are more expensive, you know, twice as expensive, butter's going up in price. And then you're trying to raise two children, in my case, two daughters, you know, where they're having healthy scratch cooked you know, meals. And now my grocery budget's twice. That's a conversation that's very delicate to have. And, and thankfully, you know, from a financial standpoint, my wife and I have, you know, we are making far more money than we did way back when, when the plate incident happened. Um, and it's, you know, we, we're still having a lot of the very same conversations. You know, how are we going to do groceries? Should we look at it, at these things in bulk? What is our eating out budget going to be? What do we have to say yes to? What do we have to say no to? You know, those conversations haven't changed, but the context in which they're having, they're, they're, we're having them has changed. Well, and that's just getting through the day to day, you know, life of food on the table, keeping the lights on, things like that. That's not even diving deeper and deeper into you know, I want to take a vacation next year, or I want to save for kids college or things like that. Right. Oh, hundred percent. And, and you know, from, the, from our human mon monkey brain, like our emotional state, like what's the base level programming we're all running around with, right? Find, find food, mate, stay out, stay away from the cougar full stop. Like we're, we're, we're we are handling a barrage of information 24 seven with a brain that was designed to find nuts in a forest. Right. Like, so, so of course, we want to, you know, we're, we're kind of forced into this place where we're all short-term thinking because we're in survival mode all the time. And, you know, what's even worse, if I want to put on my tinfoil hat for a second, is it's highly profitable, right? If you can get, if you can force consumers into short-term thinking where they're not thinking about college, they're just thinking about today, their behavior changes and it becomes hyper profitable for whoever's doing that. So then the question for me in the work is, well, how do we shift it in that we can do both? Because I don't think it's an e either or conversation. I need to put food on the table and I need to be able to make sure that when my daughter says, hey, Papa, I want to go to Harvard, that my answer is fuck yes, uh, rather than no. And I hope I can swear on here. So <laughs> I didn't ask ahead of time. For sure, my friend. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so, so that, that's the abundance that I want my children to grow up in. That requires me as the leader of my household to do both. Yeah. 
I mean, it makes perfect sense. And I mean, you talk about back in the day, we were just scavenging. We were just trying to get food on the table for our kids. We as dads have that innate, you know, need to support our family and provide for our family. And all these challenges that we're talking about really are profound from that perspective. But what can dads do to ease the burden of supporting their household? You know, you're talking about just the little things. Um, where can they start and how can they continue to ease that burden a little bit more? Yeah, I, the, the first place I always take any client that comes in to talk about money is our step. Our first step is to breathe. There, there is there's this this urge. And I, I've seen this in the dichotomy between men and women, right? Women will stick to a plan forever. They, they get freaked out about it, but they, they'll, they, they will march but they want to know why they're marching. Whereas men, if I'm, if I say, Hey, you know, here's our objective. They will eat rice and beans and crawl through broken glass, but they're also going to end up divorced. So our first step is we need to breathe and create space. It's the Victor Frankl between stimulus and response is an opportunity to change the outcome. We have to create to breathe a second to just give ourselves that space. And then I think step two is let's just agree that we're not going to judge where, how we got here. Right. There are so many times people say, oh, I should have, could have, would have done this. Well, that's great. Maybe that's true. Maybe there's some lessons there. But bringing forward that judgment only makes the future impossible. So we want to breathe and we want to start just letting go of some of the judgments. Yeah, I made mistakes. Great. Those are tuition payments. You know, I, I maybe screwed up or, you know, made a decision that if I had known differently, I would have done differently. Well, but you didn't know differently. So let's just let that go. And then the th once we're, once we're in that, now we got to look at it, right? We got to sit down and, and ask ourselves, what is our spending and what is our income? Do we actually have a spending problem or do I have an income problem? You know, professionally, I'm a tax accountant. Like I said, I run my own tax practice uh, in small business accounting. So I, I spend the, the, the tax conversation all the time. But when we move over in financial coaching, people are like, oh, I saw on TikTok, there was this cool strategy for, for taxes. And I'm, and I'm on the other side going, you don't have a tax problem. You have an income problem. You don't have enough money for me to actually even bring you on as a client and try to do advanced tax planning with you. Yeah. Let's talk about how do you, how do you raise your income? And it's those conversations and looking at it that will really formulate the actual steps. Because if you have an income problem, that's what we got to talk about. You cannot budget your way out of poverty. I tried for four years. It does not work. <laughs> right. Absolutely. What in your kind of an estimation appreciation in 2024 um, is the minimum number that a father needs to support his family of four. As an example, you've got the two daughters. Hmm. Is there a number or can they just budget? Well, I, you know, it, uh, like I, I, I want the accountant in me wants so badly to give you a number, but the, yeah. the, the systems thinker in me says the realities of me living here in Colorado would be different if I moved my family to Wisconsin. Right. And so that number is going to shift pretty radically, which is why understanding that you, this is about you, this is about your relationship to yourself and to the money. That's where you're going to arrive at that number. And in financial coaching, we'll look at it and we'll say like, okay, to pay all your bills and have the abundance that you, you say you want, here's the number we got to shoot for. So how do we get there? Right. And that really comes into the in income conversation of what's your career looking like? How are you managing stuff in the corporate world? What is your relationship to the idea of making more money? Um, and so I, I really wish I could say a number. I could throw out numbers, but none of them are going to be valid for any individual listener because the, yeah. the context is going to be different. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you always read those stories. The people that make 500,000 a year live in New York City, but they're broke living paycheck to paycheck. Right. Um, so, yeah, it makes perfect well, sense. There's there's a trap, right? I, I have huge issues with a lot of the financial commentators where like, here's your five easy tricks. Well, they're, they're not first off, they're not easy. Secondly, there's more than five. Thirdly, those they're they're blunt instruments. You get some people say, well, to retire, uh, you need to have at least five point five million dollars in an investment account. And I have a friend who retired at age 40 with seven hundred thousand. And he's you know, he's been living very <laughs> a life that I'm envious of uh, for the last five years. So, so the, it really comes down to that personal context and what you're willing to give up, what you're willing to take on, what you're willing to change. Yeah, absolutely. So you focus, sounds like primarily on kind of the basics, right? So obviously doing the budget, that's the huge one. Um, when you're coaching men, fathers, um, where to put their extra money at the end of the month, 
Um, what's kind of your go-to plan? Is it real estate? Is it just straight up investing for a 1K? What's your kind of approach as you're coaching people? So when they have extra money, the first question I'm going to ask is, what do we need this money to do for us? Right. When I, if I, it's the question, if I have handed you $5 million, no strings attached, what's the first thought that goes through your head? Is it, and, and really they kind of fall into two buckets, what I'm going to do with the money or what I want the money to do for me. And so if I, if you, you're saying like, okay, well, what I want this money to do for me, which is, is where I try to shift everybody into, uh, I want it to make it so I can take risks at work. Okay. Well, let, that's an emergency fund. We're going to have to put that into emergency fund. Let's figure out how to get that separated. You should not have your emergency fund where you have your checking account. There is a psychological impact of looking at that number and be like, oh, I've got 25 grand in my, my emergency fund. I'm fine. You're not fine. 25 grand is easy to spend. <laughs> um, you know, if you, a lot of people will say, I want passive income in real estate. Well, my family's been in real estate for 120 years. Um, you know, I've, I, we, I've worked on construction. I've done, re, I've done real estate. I did more, my first job was mortgage banking and people will say it's passive income. I, I, I will assure you it's not, it's a lot of work. And so are, are you willing to evict somebody? Are you willing to look at a single mother with kids and be like, yep, sorry, on the street with you, uh, you go. Some, yeah. if you've got that constitution, Hey, more power to you, go do it. But if you don't be realistic about what's going to keep you up at night. Um, if you're going in the 401k, let's have a conversation with what is your relationship with loss? When have you lost money in your 401k? And so to kind of put a finer point on that, you know, March 2020, every client I had was calling me. My former clients are calling me because the stock market had dropped 30%. And they said, how much money have you lost? I said, not a single cent. And they're like, well, what did you do? I just didn't sell anything. Exactly. In fact, I'm buying as fast as I possibly can. I told my wife, on sale. go. Yeah, go go dump out the couch, find, find every penny. We're going to the market. And it's been some of the best money I've ever invested. You know, and to get there, I have to have the constitution to be able to say, yeah, I can look at my my 401k balance, take a 30% hit. And I'm just like, yep, cha-ching, everything's on sale. Let's let's pile in. So it's it's really finding what is that individual take for the man? What is the what is the goal and objective they have? Not the thing that they heard. Not the thing that their men's group tells them, not the cool, sexy thing. Good personal finance is about as interesting as watching paint dry. If it is, if you are like, man, that's so fun. You are, it's, it's limbic hijack. You are being dra dragged by what's cool and sexy and, and people will profit off of you because of that. Instead, yeah, it's bread and butter, boring, systematic. You're not on this planet to be managing your finances. You're on this planet to live your life. So let's get it as systematic, as boring, and as off your plate as possible. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. Let's uh, let's kind of transition a little bit. Um, you know, I've I've listened to a lot of your podcasts where you're talking about, you know, especially men in particular being in the corporate grind, right? Um, myself in particular, I've still got my W two. I'm still doing that grind, and at age 42, I'm sitting here looking back and thinking, all right. In all my kids, I live 18 seasons of life with those kids while they're at home. Um, if that time is fleeting, do I want to be getting that W-2 from the corporate job in the next, you know, 20 years or so? So a lot of people are thinking, gosh, what is, what is this whole life about for me and what do I want to do? Um, what's kind of your recommendation when you're um, looking at those people like me in particular? Do I want to stick this out for the check? Or do I want to push forward and try to do something um, larger with my life, whether it's just hanging with the kids or whether it's, you know, making that dent in the universe? You're, you're preaching the choir. I'm of the same age, you know, I, and I, I got I got done with the corporate world and was like, yep, I, I need to have my own firm. Yeah. You know, and that that was that was a jump that I've made. So so very much feel this. I, I think that really comes down to, you know, two different conversations. Number one. I think for men specifically, we get to a point where it's like, I'm working for other people. Like I meant for more, you know, the W2, I, I should go do something. And what happens is, you know, sometimes they, they burn the boats and jump off a cliff. Um, there is nothing wrong with a W2 job. Now it's not for everybody. Um, you know, and as you work on yourself, you might find it's not, I was a corporate warrior for many, many years and very good at it. Um, when I, when I started at Ernst and Young way back when, you know, I made a name for myself real early and got, you know, promotion after promotion. And it was, I, I basically doubled my income over the next four years. 
So like, yeah, that was great. And then I started realizing like, oh, I, I need to work on myself if I want to be the father I want to be. And then I outgrew that W-2 job. And there's also tons of people who they're going to ride that to retirement or the layoff where they can't recover from. And that's perfectly fine too. The biggest thing is have a plan. Know yourself, know what, what you're charting. And when you're, when you're asking yourself like, oh, I, I should go be self-employed. Why do you want to be self-employed? Well, I want to be my own boss. Dude, I am my own boss. And I will tell you, it's it's a lot. <laughs> you know, there there needs to be a bigger mission there. So that would be the first thing is that there's nothing wrong with a W-2 and really take some time to understand yourself and your motives. The other thing I would say is W-2 employment, like we, we, we like it because it's stable, it's secure, it's predictable. Here's the thing. 50% of Americans who are W-2 employees will be laid off by the time they're 55 and not recover back to their previous level of income. This is reality. So when you have politicians saying, let's raise the retirement age, well, are you going to put protections for older workers in? Because if not, you're really just being cruel. And so this is a life event. It's just in the same way that health issues as we get older is going to happen. And, and so you need to have a plan for what that is going to, you're going to look like, what you're willing to accept. This is why at age 42, you want to be saving because you know it's by age 55, you're probably not going to be in the same position. Yeah. So it, again, it kind of goes, it goes all right back to that. You need to know yourself. You need to know where you are emotionally and what's driving you. And you need to make a plan, a plan that works for you, for your, for your life and for your kids. The dad that is watching this, listening to this and thinking, all right, I got this, you know, talent. I have this capability and I want to share it with the world. I want to podcast. I want to start um, educating people um, just like you are doing. I want to be a coach. Um, I'm curious if we can dive into, and I've seen that you have these four steps and we can walk through each of these individually, but somebody that is ready to make a change wants to break out and do something more for themselves and for their family. How can they utilize these four steps of yours, if you want to jump into these, to really start making and taking tangible steps? Hmm. I, I'm curious where you, where the four steps came from, because I've changed a lot of my material in the last year. Um, so what, what you've talked about, um, at, at least in the past, is um, look at where you want to be, look at where you are, take the next best step, go back to that first step, right? Um, and, and 100%. that seems the site, to me like a fantastic way to approach it. Cycle of improvement. So the, the first thing that you got to know is where you want to go, right? So what, whatever you want, if you're saying, well, I, you know, I really want to be a podcaster. Okay, great. Um, what does that look like? Tell me about it. Let's dream. Get a whiteboard. Um, you can kind of see it in the corner of the screen. My whiteboard. My whiteboard is, is covered in ideas. Um, I have several around my house. Uh, where I, so I, when I have an idea, I can put it on the whiteboard and, and start whiteboarding this out. Tell me if you want to be a podcaster, who, who are you talking to? What does that person need? What are they longing for? What is the thing that you see that they don't really fall in love with that state where you want to get to? And so how, how do I, how do I reach that person? Right. And then you got to look at where you are. All right. So that's step two. So I got this. I, I know exactly what I want to be. I want to be a top 10 podcast in finances. I want to be able to uh, you know, be self-employed on the coaching world. Who am I talking to? Well, I'm talking to me specifically when the day after my principal told me I needed to commit fraud to keep my job. That's who I'm talking to. I have a picture of me. I went to and I, I can tell you the I can tell you the day I just got back from a wrestling tournament. And there's a picture of me in the tournament. I've got my my school polo shirt on. I'm all dressed up for the tournament. I printed out that picture and it sits. It is framed and bolted to my wall behind my desk. That's the guy I talked to. Okay, so where am I? Well, to reach that guy, I've got to get in front of him. So where am I? Well, I'm shy. I, I don't know how to tell a story. I kind of ramble. Um, I'm, I'm worried about being out there in the world. I'm worried about saying something that will upset somebody. What if my mom listens to this? Uh, and, and then she's going to be mad at me. Um, you know, do, how do I tell this story that's going to connect with him? He doesn't even know that he's in such a hole. He's so enamored in trying to be the best teacher, best husband, best father possible. How do I reach him? And so looking at where I'm at of like, okay, so, so where, where, where do I want to be? I want to be that podcaster. Where am I at? I'm at a guy who doesn't know, you know, he, he doesn't know which end is up. 
So what's the next best step? This is step three. I need to learn how to tell a story. <laughs> okay, so who do I know that's a storyteller? Okay, I know a bunch of people who are really great at storytellers. Um, I'm going to just reach out to them blindly on Instagram. Oh, one of them lives in Denver. Oh, he actually lives five blocks from me. Would he be willing to have lunch with me? Oh, so that's how I met a couple of guys who are really good storytellers. And it was like, how did you learn this? Oh, I learned it from this, this group and this woman. And she does all these online classes. Okay, so then my what's my next best step? I signed up for her class. It's a hundred bucks on how to tell a one minute story. Sounds like it's it sounds like something kind of frivolous, but I will tell you that from a sales standpoint, for my firm, for talking to my kids, communicating to other parents, it, it was the best hundred dollars I ever spent, <laughs> hands down. So taking that next best step, and it doesn't have to be grandiose, it doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be anything that's that's you know perfect. And then after you've taken that step, you stop and you go, okay, I have now moved. And it, you can kind of think, you know, here in Colorado, uh, that we have the mountains. So I, I've climbed to the top of a hill and now I can see more trails. I can see more possibilities. Am I still wanting to go to where I thought I wanted to go? Right? Reassess. Because you've changed. Yeah. And so you need to reassess and re and maybe you do. Maybe you need to change, change directions. Maybe you're at a different place. And so you start again with the whole cycle to say, okay, where do I want to be? Where am I? What do I need to do? Rinse and repeat over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like you said, you know, if you take off from Denver in route to Australia and you make a one degree turn while you're in routes, you're going to end up, you know, thousands of miles from where you are. So each time you go back and start over again, that's where you need to reassess. Okay. I have a clearer vision, right? Um, and yeah. now where do I need to go from there? Well, and there's a, a good friend of mine who's a writer, right? You know, typical starving artist type, you know, he's, and he, he's written in the last year, he's written th uh, one movie script, two pilot shows and a novel, and he's trying to sell them. And he's, he's been having a lot of, you know, so, so where does he want to be? He wants to be a top, a top flight writer. You know, where, where is he? He's struggling to sell his book. Okay. What's the next best step? Maybe he doesn't need to sell it. Maybe it needs to be a podcast, right? Oh, so now he like, that's all he's looking at is well, what's the, what's the thing. So once he records something, okay, now you go back to the beginning. Is this viable? <laughs> do I still want to do it this way? Um, how do I get my material out there? You'll, you'll find that that cycle is basically applicable to most everything. Right. So do you throw as much up against the wall and see what sticks or do you take very decisive actions, learn from it and then readjust from there? Uh, I, so my, I always say it's the bias of action and I'm, I'm, that's not a Dylan Bain original. I picked it up from somewhere, but I don't know who to give credit to. Um, but the idea of bias towards action, my wife will tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm more likely to jump off the cliff and then go, okay, how do I fly? Um, then I'm <laughs> trying to figure this out. What I found though, is that then you're, you're, you're getting too much feedback at the same time. So find the next best step, find one thing you're going to change. It's like, if you want to, you know, my, my physical health is something that has always been a struggle for me, um, trying to keep weight off and trying to stay physically fit. Okay. So if I change my diet, I go to BJJ, I start running with my dog and then I, I weight lift three times a week and then, then things aren't right. Well, which one is the one that isn't right? I have no idea. Or is it because I'm right. trying to do too many? So I would say like, pick one thing. I'm going to go run with my dog or I'm going to go to BJJ two times a week, pick one thing do it for 30 days and then stop and be like, how is this working? You know, maybe you like BJJ and you find out like, oh my God, this community and this network is that that's feeding me. Or maybe you're like, you know, honestly, I just don't like being touched that much. I'm just, I, I want more solitude in my life. Okay, good. So rinse, repeat, go out for a hike, <laughs> you know, spend time with yourself, leave your phone and all your technology there. See what, see what happens there. It's, I am a big fan of, of a bias towards action, but I'm a bigger fan of a bias towards a single action so that I can understand what the result of that action is. And that applies to your finances too. If you try to change everything at once, man, you, you're, you're in for a really rough ride. But if you're like, you know what, I'm just going to try to not eat out 10% less this month. That is a dream is achievable. And you might find out that eating out is actually really important to your mental health. <laughs> like, and that happens. And so, okay, so now we got to rinse and repeat. But if I try and change multiple things, I won't know which one is actually having the effect. Yeah. Well, and it's key to 
double tap on the fact that the one thought, small thing that you're changing isn't, oh, I'm going to lose 50 pounds in one month. That's the goal. That's not the step that you're taking, right? So either start with taking the hike or start with the exercise three times a week, but don't just say the large thing is the goal. Let's break it down into those smaller pieces. 100%. Good stuff. So let's change it up a little bit. Um, do we really need financial coaches? You're a financial coach. Can people just do this on their own? So if you can do it on your own, hey, go do it on your own. Don't hire me. I'm, I'm expensive. <laughs> Good luck with that. Stop and think about this for a second. The the monkeys in, out in the, the forest don't have a spreadsheet to track their banana intake and, and consumption rate. They don't. There is nothing in our evolutionary past that would make us able to be well-adjusted in our current society. There are no spreadsheets in nature, just like there's no straight lines. So now you add into what you have on the other side of the equation. It's like day traders, right? Day traders, they'll say like, oh, I'm going to do some day trading with some options and stuff. Great. Do you believe you can take on Goldman Sachs? Do you believe you can take on Magellan supercomputers? Do you believe that you know something that the members of Congress do not? Because they're the people on the other side of the table playing the game. Do you think you can beat them? Now, I, I'm, I've been in, in high finance for a long time. <laughs> I'm extremely smart. I can do data analysis and computer modeling, all the stuff. And I do not play that game because I can't yeah. beat Goldman Sachs. So it's the same thing with your credit card. Why, do they, why are they offering credit card points? Why, are you, why do you go to, to the King Supers or the Safeway or the Albertsons and they ask you for your phone number? Because you're playing a massive game where their goal is to get as much out of you as possible. And your goal is to keep as much in your pocket as possible. So the question here is, is that why would we know out of the box as a stock human how to play that game? The reason you hire a financial coach is because for me, this is where I'm specialized. We live in a specialized economy, right? If I got to, if I got to, you know, if I need carpentry done, I'm sitting in an office uh, that is a shed in my backyard. I didn't build this thing because I'm not a carpenter. I hired a guy who knows everything there is to know about this thing. My job as a financial coach is to know everything about the psychology of money, to know about the simplicity, what works, what doesn't, what advice is out there. And so that coach is there because they've said, oh, there's this one part of the economy. I'm going to study it so you don't have to. And then I'm going to help teach you. It's the same thing with nutritional coaching. You know, if we all, you know, if we all, uh, you know, ate like our ancestors would be fine, but that's a really expensive and b really difficult in the modern industrial food chain, which is why nutritionists exist, right? Relationship coaching. Like we all know how to do the thing to make kids, but do we know how to do it well so that she's happy and you're happy and the kids are happy. Right. And so we have an entire set of coaches for that too, because we live in a fragmented society. I truly believe that if we, if the suburbs were to go away tomorrow and we, we started living more traditionally that no, we coaches would not be necessary, but in our current fragmented society, we're absolutely critical. And you're seeing the coaching industry increase because I think we all feel that we've lost elders. We've lost wisdom. We've lost these community. We lost cultural guardrails that makes things like self-sufficiency and frugality, just part of our makeup as people. And so the solution that that has started to arise is people like myself who's like, hey, I got this one talent. Let me teach you. Because if I teach you, you'll teach your kids and the world will become a better place. Time is one of the most finite resources we have. So if you can utilize a coach to accelerate your time to the result that you want, it makes perfect sense. Do you, do you need to, <laughs> are, are you only capable of learning from your own mistakes or you can watch somebody else burn their hand on the stove and go, yeah, that's probably hot. Yeah. Trust me. I've burned my hand on the stove a lot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. Let's, let's do some rapid fire questions, Dylan, if we okay. can. Um, so 20, 30, you can go longer if you want. Um, second answers on these and, uh, we'll just get your take on these, on these questions. So, um, you've mentioned in the past, uh, not to numb out on certain things. What do you mean when you talk about don't numb out, um, on, on whatever topic there might be, uh, of the day for, for men? So <laughs> our society is a numb out society between social media, availability of illicit drugs, uh, availability of porn, availability of food. And that's my big one, right? I'll eat my feelings. Um, but this also includes work. 
right? The guy who, who will stay at the office longer, the people who overwork out with body dysmorphia, there's, there's no end to the number of things you can, you can numb out from, but whatever you're numbing out from is the thing in the shadow that's going to come get you. And, and it's hard to face. I, I can't, I can't say this enough. It's hard to face, but that numbing action is only increasing the power of that thing in the shadow. And so the solution is you got to figure out what you're numbing, whether it's doom scrolling on social media, Instagram reels, only fans, it doesn't matter. Go without it and then start looking for the place, look in the place you least want to look. And when you, when it's not numb, it's easy to find. Yeah. When your kids notice, right? hundred percent. You may not think that they, they aren't, um, you know, paying attention, but they absolutely are. And it, it harms them for a long time. Kids learn in one, three ways, what you model, what you model and what you model. Pick whichever I'll works take, for you. I'll take indeed. <laughs> I love it. Uh, HELOC, is that a good or a bad thing? Depends on how you use it. Um, the biggest thing with, with a HELOC is if you're using that as a credit card, you are wagering your family's shelter based upon your spending habits. How trustworthy are you on your spending habits? That is a, that is a question. So HELOCs, you know, they, they have their purposes, right? Um, you know, I, I had a client who, you know, he had paid off his house and he was like, what do I do? I said, well, get a HELOC. Now you can use that as an emergency fund. It's a, it's a guaranteed draw that you can have on it. What did he do? He ended up doubling his acreage with it. You know, all cash offer, you know, was able to buy the, the lot right behind him. So he went from 10 acres to 20 acres. Um, now he's got horses and, and stuff and goats and stuff out there. It's great. Um, you know, that to me is a good use of HELOC paying off all your credit cards. Let's have a conversation about how you got in the credit card debt first, because if you haven't solved that, now you just piled it on your house. Got it. Got it. Makes perfect sense. Crypto. You down with crypto? Where do you see it going now that we've got a new administration coming in? Oh, that's a that's a really complicated question. Um, so try to keep that in 20 to 30 seconds. That's going to be hard. So I, I, I want to separate crypto from Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Uh, okay. For a second and say Bitcoin's a separate, a separate thing. I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about crypto. The thing I noticed in the crypto industry is that I, I truly believe that it has a place in the future. Uh, the blockchain technology is, is quite powerful, and but we nobody knows how to use it yet. The other thing about I'll say about crypto is that they are stumbling backwards one scandal at a time into understanding why financial regulations exist. Right. The number of scams, rug pulls, pump and dump schemes that you see in crypto are huge. Again, it goes back to good personal finance is about as fun as watching paint dry. If you're excited about this crypto protocol and you think it's going to be, it's going to go to the moon, um, you're probably being sold on something and you should take a, take a big, a big step back. That said, I dabble in crypto. I've made a lot of money in crypto. Yeah. Um, understand the game you're playing. You're not pay playing any fundamentals. There's no fundamentals in terms of crypto. There's no understanding that you're playing the people that are also in the market. And so, you know, if you're going to do that, understand you're not playing crypto, you're playing people just like a poker game. And number two, don't go more than 10% of your investable assets. Every, every dime you put into crypto should be a dollar you're willing to put in a bucket and light on fire. Yep. Because it could happen. A hundred percent. And with the new administration, I think that we're going to, I think we're going to see a renaissance of crypto. I, I think we're going to see enough flexibility that maybe we'll actually figure out how to properly use the technology, but we're also going to see because of, of lower regulations and lower enforcement, a ton more scams. And so I think, you know, it's a double-edged sword. You know, freedom is a double-edged sword. So understand the game you're playing. Makes perfect sense. Health savings accounts. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you really like those. Can you kind of give some of the benefits? And if somebody has the ability to get into that um, high deductible health plan, should they get one of those health savings accounts? That is the absolute first place that you should be doing your savings in. Um, it's a triple check tax advantaged account. You get a tax deduction to put it in there. The money grows tax free. And if you withdraw it correctly, you get to withdraw that and the gains tax free. Triple check advantage. Huge, huge fan of it. It's the first thing I max out. Um, the big thing with it is that it, you know, with all great things and all powerful things, you have to know what you're doing to wield it properly. Um, so for example, I don't use my health savings account to pay for any of my medical expenses. I just don't, I pay it out of cash flow. You know, we, that's part of the budget. You know, I'm, you know, <laughs> genetically I'm doing much better than most of the other men in my family still have the high blood pressure meds. 
And so we, you know, my wife and I, we plan for those, those foreseeable futures. We have some savings in cash that we can use. Like when my daughter broke her arm back in May, uh, we had that in a savings account. The reason I'm not touching the health savings account is that all the bills for my daughter breaking her arm, I saved those. Now at any time in the future, I can, I can get the reimbursement. So really? I have, yes, there's no statute of limitations on the reimbursement. So if I want, if I wanted to right now, my first receipts I'm going to turn in for to be reimbursed for are from 2015 when I had my first high deductible savings plan. And so I've kept every one of those receipts. I've tracked it in a spreadsheet. I have on my site, um, dylanbain.com. There's some templates out there to help you track that, but I've got them going back. So now if I'm like, Hey, you know, I need, I, I really, you know, I, my wife gets in an accident, got to replace a car. I don't want to have a car loan. I could withdraw that from my health savings account. And I'm actually, I'm withdraw, able to withdraw the gains tax-free. Yeah. The other you know, big advantage is that once you hit the right age and that that's an act of Congress, it can be treated just like a traditional IRA. So it's a, it's a retirement account too. I, I can't say enough good things about health savings accounts. Um, they're really just a wonderful tool, particularly for middle-class folks. Yeah, we do, we do the exact same thing. Um, my company fortune, you know, 500 company matches and they'll provide up to $2,000 a year as long as I contribute a certain amount into it. So again, tax-free, those three ways, plus you're getting matches from your company. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, it's about the only place you can really double dip because you can also have a traditional IRA at the same time, right? Your contributions to one is not is not damaging the other. Same with a traditional yeah. 401k. So, you know, if you're if you're in a at a certain tax level, man, <laughs> if you're not maxing out that HSA, you're leaving money on the table. Yeah, got it, good. Uh, college savings. You got two daughters. One of them wants to go to Harvard. It sounds like, but uh, <laughs> what, what's your thought? Um, should we as dads be planning to pay for and save for all of our children's education? Should they be potentially taking out loans, or should we do you know them paying for some and us paying for some? So my goal is to set my daughters up in a better position than when I started, right? And I was fortunate enough that my father was able to help me through my undergrad. Um, and then for my grad school, I was a security guard for the university, which made my schooling free. So I don't want my daughter to have to work third shift security. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so I'm, yeah, we're in a savings plan. There's a lot of different savings plans. The 529 is the one that's easiest to understand and has the best advantages. So, you know, they're, they're state specific, um, but you can invest like my daughter's savings plan is in New York state using their 529 program, but it's, you can use it for any university that's a qualified education expense. The thing I'll say about college is that I'm a big believer that college has a place. Yes, even the history degree. I mean, one of my undergraduate degrees is history. So I got to say this, I'm contractually obligated to say, yes, there's, there's use to it. The important thing in my mind is you have to start having the conversation with your kids about what is your plan. If you get to age 18 and you don't know what you're going to do or how you want to craft your way through the university, don't go. There are so many gap year options. Um, you know, and I've had the conversation with my oldest daughter because she's going to go first of like, start thinking about it now. You're under no obligation. You can change your mind as many times as you want. I do have I have no horse in this race. But when you hit 18 and you say, Papa, I want to go to college, we're going to have a conversation about a plan. What is your plan? If you say, well, I want to go into psychology. Great. You're going to need a PhD. So that means that you've got eight years of school. And then when you come out of that school, you're going to be really low paid for the first three years while you build your private practice. What's your plan? Yep. If she's saying, well, I don't know what to do. Okay. Well, maybe the air force is a good option. Maybe, you know, you can live at home and you can work yep. while you figure this out. Go to AmeriCorps. It doesn't really matter so long as we have a plan. Starting a budget, 20, 30 seconds. What's your recommendation for somebody that's never done a budget before? How can they get themselves started? Uh, <laughs> breathe, forgive yourself, write down all of your income, all of your expenses. Like literally just print out all of your bank accounts, all of your credit card statements, and then just make two columns on, on Google Sheets. Here's my income, here's my expenses. Add, add them both up and subtract. You see a lot of people to... that don't have budgets. I mean, it's, it's oh, all the time profound, huh? The vast majority of people don't have a budget and there's an impression that budgets are for poor people. So I'm, it's, 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 it's like, well, I make too much money. I don't need a budget. Whereas I've heard poor people be like, I don't make enough money. I don't need a budget. And I've heard rich people be like, I'm too rich. I don't need a budget. 
And I, I'll promise you all of them need a budget. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Makes sense. Good stuff. All right. Rapid fire. Done. We'll start landing the plane here. I've just got a couple more questions for you. First, um, Dylan, where can people find you? How can they learn more about you? Uh, yeah. So my website for, or for financial coaching, my website, dylanbain.com, uh, has all of the information on how to work with me, how to find me. I'm very easy to find. Uh, you can go to dylanbain.com slash tools and all of my free tools that I use during financial coaching are available for free. So if you can figure it, if you can download them and make them work. Hey, go for it. Uh, you don't need me, but if you need extra support, I'm available there. Uh, small business accounting wise, you can find me at, at, at uh, true north CPAs with an S because there's two of us in the partnership.com. Uh, and that is my professional website uh, for, you know, all the accounting tax, financial planning, any of the, the more high level uh, impersonal stuff. Nice. Got it. Good, good. I'll link all that down in the description below. I appreciate that. All right. So just three more questions for you. Um, Let's do and, it. And, and these are I think these are the most important ones as we kind of move forward, right? So what is the number one thing dads should be doing to get ahead financially today? Work on themselves. You, you're, you're the basis of everything, right? When, when, the, when it hits the fan, your wife is going to look to you. When, when it hits the fan, your kids are going to look to you. Work on yourself and work on yourself professionally, work on yourself emotionally, work on yourself mentally. Get outside of the box, get out of your comfort zone. Get, go go explore opportunities and experiences that you're like I don't need that that's terrifying yeah okay that's exactly what you need so the dads you need to work on yourself period yeah yeah like you said whether it's professionally um, or or just not being numbed by all of those things um, get the coach that's a fantastic appreciation for that answer thank you um, what's the biggest mistake you see dads making with money? Thinking they have it all figured out, thinking that it needs to be somehow complicated. Um, yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of extra time on this, but it's a great illustration. Fidelity did a study once to, to figure out who were the best retail investors. That's you and I, we're retail investors. Um, who, what, what commonalities do they have? Well, they found that there were three types. Those who had forgotten they had an account, those who had died and their account hadn't been closed, and women. <laughs> and in that order. And so... You know, why is it that guys aren't in there? Because we get really cute thinking we've got it all figured out. You don't um, understand. Uh, take some humility. Read a book. Uh, you know, you know. I, if you want books, there's an entire recommendation list on my website. Um, don't get cute. This doesn't. This is not complicated. Complicated does not mean good. Simple means good. Makes makes perfect sense. So this this last one. <clears throat> It doesn't have to necessarily be about finance um, in particular. I listened to a guy named uh, Graham Cochran. He's, he's a good financial coach. He also does a lot of business stuff. But he has this question at the end of his podcast, so I'm taking it. Um, and it's basically diamond advice. So you have two daughters. How old are your daughters again? They are 12 and 9. Nice. Yes. So your daughters are all grown. They're out of the house. They're out of college. And they've forgotten everything you've ever taught them except for one thing. The one thing that you want them to know, kind of like diamond advice moving forward in their lives, what would that one thing be? I am worthy of greatness. That That is, I mean, I'm getting a little emotional just saying it. That is the thing that I want my daughters to, to have more than anything else. I am worthy of greatness because what are the next thoughts? I am capable of greatness. I am worth greatness. I am, I, I deserve, the world needs my gifts. I am worthy of greatness is the one piece of diamond advice I want my daughters to have imprinted on their soul. Dylan Bain, thank you for the time, sir. This was fantastic. It's been my pleasure. Yeah, let's let's get back together. This is this was a great conversation. Have a great holiday as we move forward. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk soon. Fantastic.